One of the greatest uh, experiences that I've ever, uh, in, in, I just remember so clearly and enjoyed, was uh, when Mary Faye came to church here, and I went to visit the house, and Wayne got saved that night. In fact, I think Joe Griffin was with me that night, and Wayne got saved. And I never will forget Wayne praying and uh, calling out on God to save him with a broken heart. And, uh, and of course, he was in Bible college. That was on a Tuesday night. And uh, I went to school on Thursday morning. He's in the 8 o'clock class, and I start telling this story about this lady who visited our church. And he's just sitting out there listening, you know. And uh, you know, I went to see this lady, and I met her husband. And, and good man, hadn't hardly missed one handful uh, days of work in how many years. And shared the gospel with him, and he, he cried out to the Lord for salvation. And Justin's just listening away. I said, and Justin Leisure's granddaddy got saved. And we had revival meeting, amen, at 8 o'clock in the morning. And he started shouting, and we had a great time. And uh, I, I love this brother. And, of course, Brother Woodward uh, was a man that uh, God used to get Brother Justin already saved, but uh, get Justin on track and serving God. And, and now he's been down there in Arizona for these. Never forget, man, he told me early on, he said, I'm going to Arizona to start a church. And he didn't vary from that. That's what he's done. I'm glad tonight he's here to preach. Glenda's going to sing. After she's done, you listen carefully tonight to Brother Leisure. It'll be a blessing. good to be here tonight, and uh, I love this place, I love your preacher, and uh, I always, whenever I come here, it uh, just always kind of feels like home, and, uh, and so uh, I'm thankful for everything you all have always accomplished, and, uh, and for letting your preacher invest in some young men up at the college, and uh, I am one of those, and, uh, and so obviously taking good care of my grandparents as well, while I'm so far away is always a blessing. And I know they're in good hands because they're here. 
and I don't worry too much about them. So, and uh, if you got your Bibles and I go to Mark chapter nine, Mark chapter nine, preacher, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, I want to give you something that uh, the Lord has kind of taught me out there in Arizona. And uh, you think you learn everything in college till you actually get out there and start doing stuff. You find out how much you didn't learn. And, uh, but the Lord continues to teach, and the Lord uses other men to teach in your life and preaching that you hear. And so, uh, something that I've uh, really, I don't know if I can say I've gotten a hold of it, something I'm trying to get a hold of, and something I'm trying to get our church to truly get a hold of. And I know this, we're a lot closer uh, to getting a hold of it than what we were when we started. And uh, so if you're there in Mark chapter 9, let's pick it up in verse number 14. Mark chapter 9, verse number 14. The Bible says, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they could cast him out, and notice this, and they could not. He answered him, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when, they saw, when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch as many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. I want to speak to you for just a little while tonight on this thought. Something is missing. Father, would you please help us tonight? And, uh, Lord, I just want to be a blessing, Lord, these people. This church has been a blessing to me so many times in this preacher. And, Lord, if I can just return a little bit of that in this message tonight, Father, that would be good. And so, Father, I pray that you speak to our hearts. Help me to help them. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Here are many of you that are familiar with your Bible, familiar with the story. Jesus and, and three of his disciples had been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, during that time that they were up there, uh, this man brought uh, his son that had been possessed of a devil to the other disciples. And the Bible tells us in verse number 18 uh, that they could not cast out the devil that was in him. Jesus comes down from the mountain uh, after the transfiguration that uh, the three witnessed. And, of course, uh, the, uh, t- Jesus sees the, the tumult kind of going on there, and his attention turns to it. He asks, he says, what's going on? Uh, the father approaches, the people approach, and say, well, listen, this child has a devil in him. Nobody can do anything about it. Uh, Jesus rebukes the, those around a little bit. Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? And they bring the child to him. Of course, Jesus, uh, having all power, takes care of the situation rather quickly. And then, as the scene dissipates, we find this in verse number 28. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? Now listen, I give the disciples a lot of credit right there. Because you know, there's many times we try and do something through the power of the Lord. There's many times we try and accomplish something for God, and we could not. And I feel many times we don't have the guts to ask the Lord, why not? Because we're afraid of what the answer is. Because we know the Lord's going to tell us the truth. And so I give the disciples a lot of credit. Lord, why could we not cast... What was wrong? Why could we not cast Him out? Now it's important you understand this. Go back a little bit. Go back to Mark chapter 6 because I want you to see a couple things. I want you to understand that 
the disciples' question was very genuine and very brave. In Mark chapter 6, uh, and look at verse number 7. And he called unto him the twelve, same group of guys, right? And he began to send them four two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Now, according to that, they should have been able to. Because Jesus gave them the power to do it. Look at verse 13 of that same chapter. The, the twelve go out, and as they come back, here's what it says, And they cast out many devils, and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. This was not new for the disciples. They had dealt with devils before. They had successfully cast out devils before. But this particular one, as the boy came, they could not. They had before, but this time they could not. You say, what was the difference? The Bible doesn't necessarily tell us what the difference was in the devil per se. You know, maybe one was stronger, maybe not. Look at Luke 9. Luke 9, verse 1, this is the parallel passage of what we just read in Mark 6. Luke 9, verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils. Well, you reckon the one that was in this child qualified as one of the all? They had power over all of them. So why is it they could not? Jesus gave them the power to do it, but yet they could not. They, having enough guts, come to the Lord and say, Lord, why could we not? We've done it before. We've cast out devils before. We've seen, we've seen your power work before. We've been successful before. Why is it we could not? It's because something was missing. It's obvious something was missing. Because they've been in a similar situation before and had success. This time the situation comes up and they have no success. Something was missing. It was not beyond their ability through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to do it. Something was missing in their life. Back there in Mark chapter 9 and verse number 29, we find out what it was that was missing. And he said unto them, this is Jesus' response to why could we not cast him out. This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. I'm a King James guy. I wasn't always a King James guy. I came to that position. I, I got saved in a church that, you know, they, they, it was in the pulpit, but that's the only place it was. And sometimes the preacher would check with his wife what the NIV said in, in the pew. And so I came to that position. I don't study from them. I have no use for them. I, I don't quote from them. I do not like to give the devil any credit for anything he's done. But I do know some things about those versions from my experience with them. And in, in, in coming to the position of the King James, I looked at those other things. I did some study in them so that I could prove to myself that that book was right. That that book was perfect. That that book was the one. And I've, I, I found several things that with those, when changes are made, it's always for a reason. And important things are the things that are changed. Would you find it interesting tonight if I told you that in every major modern version, other than the language differences that exist in verse number 29, there is one word that is missing in every single one of them. Fasting. You pick up an NIV, an ESV, an NAS, you name it. That word fasting is not in that verse. That ought to tell you something. The devil knows how important it is. Because this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. If it just tells you to pray, you're still not going to get the victory. 
It's prayer and fasting. That's not the only thing missing in those Bibles, let me tell you, but something's missing in those Bibles, and it's the word fasting. Lord's power is missing, the Lord's blessing is missing, all kinds of things are missing. But that word fasting is missing in just about every one of them. And listen, there's so many now, you can't say every one of them because you can't look, check all 250 anymore. But all the major ones, it's missing. But my concern tonight is not what is missing in an NIV Bible. My concern tonight is not what's missing in an ESV or any other version uh, you want to bring up. My concern tonight is that fasting is not just missing there. It's missing here. It's missing in our churches. That's what concerns me tonight. Not that it's missing in some version of the Bible that we don't even care about and use, but that it's missing in our independent, Bible-believing, Baptist churches. It's missing. missing sometimes in the preacher's lives. It's missing sometimes in the lives of the assistant pastors and the school teachers and the Sunday school teachers and the ushers and anybody else that sits in the pew. It's missing. It's missing in the pulpit from what I can tell. Listen, I, I told you I've always been an independent Baptist, but I have now for a little while. I was in Bible college. In Bible college, I heard about ten sermons a week. I've been to all kinds of conferences. I've been to missions conferences and revivals and Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night now for years in my life. I've, I'm trying to get you to this point. I've heard a lot of preaching. But in all that time, outside of messages that I have preached myself, I can count on one hand the messages I've heard on fasting. Something's missing. Something's missing. Now understand tonight, nowhere in the New Testament can I take you to a place where it commands you and I to fast. There are places in the Old Testament that the Jews through different uh, uh, times uh, nationally and through different parts of the season and feasts and different things, they were commanded to do it. I can't take you any place in the New Testament and show you where the local New Testament church is commanded to fast. But I can take you to plenty of places where it was assumed that we would. Let me ask you tonight. When did fasting stop being a normal part of Christianity? When you hear about it, everybody's like, wow, he fasted. And the water parted and... The Bible kind of teaches it like normal Christianity. Jesus, as He was speaking and teaching in Matthew chapter 6, He said, when you fast. Not if you fast. He said, when you fast. Why? He was assuming you and I would do it. The Pharisees came to Him and His disciples one day. They said, now, and you know the Pharisees. Whoa, whoa, why do your disciples fast not? We fast. John's disciples fast. How come yours don't fast? See, they kind of had an out here because he was because this is what he said. He said, well, the bridegroom's here. You can't fast when the bridegroom's here. So see, they were kind of off the hook here. But Jesus was preparing them for the future because he did say this after that. He said, when the bridegroom's gone, they'll fast. Why? Because there'll be a need. You say, well, I'm glad it's optional. Hey, it's op- we're not commanded. It's optional. It's maybe assumed. It's maybe expected. It's supposed to be part of normal Christianity. <sighs> optional. Can I tell you something? It may be optional, but so is the victory over this kind. Because this kind come forth but by nothing. Hey, it's optional. But so is the victory. When you opt not to do it, you opted not to get the victory. Because there's only one. And listen, 
I don't know. We know what this kind was right here. Okay? It was a devil. But he didn't say this kind of devil. He said this kind. In other words, a struggle that deep. Uh, a, 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 a demonic force that powerful. And listen, if you think he's still not roaming about seeking whom he may devour. I guarantee you, you and I have come across this kind in our life before. Some of you may be facing this kind right now. And if you haven't, I assure you, you stay in this thing long enough, you'll face this kind. And there's only one option. Come forth but by nothing, but prayer and fasting. You know what that means? You and I can pray all night long and there's no victory. You and I can pray and pray and pray and there's no victory. Because that one word's missing. Listen, because it's not talked about it much, because it seems like some supernatural thing, and, and, and it, let me just give you a couple things. What am I talking about? Well, in essence, when the Bible talks about fast or the word fast, it simply means abstinence, to go without. Primarily, it means to go without food. It's used in other contexts. The Bible talks about watchings. That's fasting in the area of sleep, going without sleep. Bible uses it in one other context in a husband and wife relationship in Corinthians. But nine times out of ten, when the Bible speaks about fasting, it's talking about going without food for a period of time. Men is, went as long as 40 days. Now, that's not something you just turn around and do, amen. There's a multitude of, I've heard, I, the, the teaching I have heard, the things I have read, there's a multitude of different opinions on fasting. But I had a preacher challenge me in this area. He just happened to believe the Bible. And he said, you know, the, really the heart of fasting is water only. It's water only. And listen, sometimes, sometimes those guys did miraculous there's guys that went 40 days, no food, no water. Listen, you and I try that, he'll be preaching your funeral. That's, that's the honest truth. You can't do that. That was supernatural, what God did for them. And I don't have that kind of faith. Maybe you do. I don't. I'm going to drink some water. Listen, it does, it, it, it's not some special magical thing that manipulates God. It's not going to obligate God. But we know this, God does honor His Word. Let me just give you a couple thoughts as to why it might be missing. I mean, there's got to be a reason, right? If it's missing, there's got to be a reason. If you can't find your car keys, there's a reason. If you can't find your wallet, there's a reason. If something's missing, there's a reason why it's missing. Let me suggest a couple things tonight. Number one, fasting requires sacrifice. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you food, and we know that doesn't fly well with Baptists. Some of us, you, you, we'd rather lose anything than a Sunday afternoon meal. might cost you food, might cost you sleep. Could it be that we're just too selfish to fast? That it's too much about us? That we're really not interested in crucifying the old man? We're not interested in being crucified with Christ and then nevertheless living? Yet not I, but Christ in me? Last time I fasted, that's what it was for. Because this flesh was getting too, too strong. And there were some things that I just, I had to get victory over. Now, I don't know if it was this kind or not, but I was starting to feel that way. It took a while. 
Preacher, uh, you were there. It was pretty transparent this morning. The Lord just told me to be pretty transparent. I'll tell you this. You can sit me down afterwards if you want. You know, I started fasting. It took ten days for me to hear the voice of God. Ten days. Ended up going another six after that. And I'm not trying to... The truth of the matter is, I I had a few more days I wanted to tack on to it, but I started having some issues and I felt it wise to back away. And what I had heard was pretty sweet, so... So you must have been in a mess. There's a lot of things. I was doing doing plenty of things right. But I needed to hear what I needed to hear. I needed some help. Listen, it required sacrifice. And I'm not telling you you've got to go home and start fasting for ten days to hear the voice of God or anything else. And you you understand what I mean when I say that. I didn't have some delusional fit and hear some audible voice or nothing else. Ten days you might be thinking that way, but <laughs> but it required some sacrifice. At the time I was working a job where I had the summers off, I did it in the summer in Arizona. I spent a lot of time as I went in just laying around. No energy left. I don't have a lot to spare. And that same period of time, I read my Bible through completely. I, I, I'm sorry, I read my Bible through in 40 days. That wasn't the time period I'd said, I wish I could. But I don't think I'd exist anymore if I went 40 days. I'm trying to pack some on. I read my Bible through in 40 days. I'd mapped it all out how to do it. Man, I, I reading for 10 days... I did all that, and, and it took ten days. I don't know why I'm even telling all this, but I'll tell you what happened. My head's on the pillow after sleeping. And I opened my eyes that morning, and it was as if I heard him say, And the sheep hear the voice, and they know it's the shepherd. It was so real, I was scared to open my eyes. But it was so sweet. The rest of the prayers were a little different for the next six days. The time on my face was a little different for the next six days. And boy, I was cherishing it. I was, I was disappointed when I had to break early. Requires sacrifice. But most things in life that require sacrifice are worth it. Secondly, let me say this. It could be missing because it results in affliction. Let me show you a couple of things. Take your Bible, go to Daniel 10, and I won't be much longer. I'm going to hurry. I respect the fact that most of you here have worked all day, and you love the Lord enough to come to church after all of that, and hear some guy holler at you and try and put you under conviction. And I'm still a little bivocational myself, so sometimes I preach short on Wednesday night for my own sake. Amen? So I'm with you. Look at Daniel 10. I don't want you to miss this. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel did a lot of fasting. and Look at verse number 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. This was a fast. If you study it all out, you see that. He says in verse 3, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I know it myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And also it says there, use the term mourning. Look down at verse number 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel. 
For from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. The terms mourning, the terms chastening are associated with this thing of fasting. Look at Psalm 69. Psalm 69, verse 10. Psalm 69, verse 10. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. Look at Psalm 109. Just want you to see the terminology associated with it. Psalm 109, verse 24. My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh faileth of fatness. You're going to get serious about the matter? Listen, <laughs> let me just put it this way. You're not feeling it, you're not fasting. Now here, the, the, way, the day and age in which we live in the American diet and everything else, let me tell you, you usually feel within 24 hours because you're missing your caffeine. Truth of the matter is, is the worst time is the first three days. You think, how could you do, you know, ten days? By day four, I was feeling pretty good. My body was cleaned out of all the junk that I put in it all the time, all the sugar, all the caffeine, all that. And there's smart ways you can build up to it. You purge the caffeine while you're still eating and things like that. So you go through the, the headaches and the hard part in the beginning, and then when you actually get to the fasting, it's a, you know makes it a little easier. I don't think that's cheating. I don't think that's wrong. I don't think the Lord minds because you still feel it. Listen, I was pretty weak. You put some days on it, you, there's going to be weakness. Why? You're chastening your flesh. It's associated with mourning. Lastly, if you go back to the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, if you go to Matthew 9. It could be missing this way because it reveals our weaknesses. I said the disciples, I feel, were very brave to ask the Lord, why could we not? Because usually when we have a weakness, we just don't ask. We'd rather hide it and pretend like everything's okay. Because when we have to go to the Lord and say, why could we not? It shows our inability to accomplish something. And we know that the problem was not with Him. So there's only one place it can lie. Matthew 9, verse number 14. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and they shall fast. Why? Because the Lord wasn't going to be physically present with them anymore, and they were going to need it. Because they were going to need Him. They were going to need to get victory over the, this kind that was going to exist and come across them. You see, you and I have a tendency to want to think, well, we can do it. You know, we quote, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, and it's true. But we could fast, and He'd strengthen us too. Oftentimes what we need is to be humbled. And a fast will do that. A fast will humble. It will humble the flesh. It will humble your spirit. Because you've got nothing left. Because what do you need daily? What are you supposed to need daily more than this? Put your eyes straight there. And it reveals our weakness. Lord, obviously, like I said, dealt with my heart about this matter just a couple years into pastoring. In fact, this message was written probably five or so years ago for my church, and I've preached many times along this line since. But it was after the Lord dealt with my heart, and the Lord dealt with my heart not just about me, and not just about the folks in the church, but 
He took me in other directions. I continued to study and look at things, and I studied the book of Acts. I found that churches did this together. Israel did it together. And I found that churches did it together. And I said, hmm, there's a thought. And so we've instituted a couple things. Every month, as the Lord leads a topic, it changes, it varies every month. But every month there is one scheduled day of church-wide fasting at East Valley Baptist Church. It's, it's in the bulletin right there, just like you guys have a prayer sheet. You know, this is a missionary we're praying for this week. This is so-and-so we're praying for. This is this. We're so... Right there, the last thing is the fasting date for the month. And listen, not everybody does it. I know that. You know that. They know that. And they know I know that. Three is better than none. And five is better than none. And ten is better than none. Better than doing nothing. Better than pretending like it's not in the Bible. The Lord's helped us with it. He has. I was sharing with your preacher, this has been, this past year, we're, we're, we're starting year nine, first Sunday in December, so we're just finishing up year eight. And I shared with him, you know, you come back to these things, how's it going, brother? You know, that's what everybody wants to say. I, I, I don't like to lie. So, you know, I tell the truth, and sometimes the truth is tough. This, is, this has been, this year, our church has gone through deeper water than any other year. I've experienced things that were hurtful and painful beyond anything I'd experienced before in the ministry. This, and, and that's not, uh, I can't complain because it took eight years to, for that to happen. I had seven years really of blessedness. Not that there's not struggles, of course there is, but the, there's things this year that are the things you try and avoid at all possibility. There's always struggles in the ministry, that's part of it, you sign up for that. But there are, there are aspects of the ministry you try and avoid. But usually they find you. Some of those things found us this year. And I've tried to contemplate many things. I've tried to contemplate maybe where I messed up and, you know, where maybe just the Lord was trying us and maybe we're just, you know, things happen. And all the evaluation, I did come to this conclusion also. This has been the year that East Valley Baptist Church has fasted the least. Because you know why I think some things started to happen and I was dealing with some burdens and dealing with some different things? I wasn't thinking about it. I was too caught up in the, the issues to be thinking about, Lord, what should we be fasting about this month? Probably the issues I was caught up with, but that probably would have been good. But some of it was stuff I had to hold in my heart as a pastor at that time also. So maybe the two coincide. Maybe it was just our time. Maybe it was just something that the Lord's wanting to do with us. But I did come to that conclusion. Go to Luke 9 and I'm finished. Luke 9 is the parallel portion of Scripture to where we started in Mark 9. Same event, the, the young child that was brought after the Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples couldn't do anything about it. Jesus takes care of the situation. Look at verse 42. And as he was yet a coming, the devil threw him down and tear him, and Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. Because fasting is missing in our churches, in our lives. Because fasting is missing. I want you to see the other thing that is missing. Jesus comes down from the mount, takes care of the situation, right? Look at the next verse, 43. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. Seems to me those two things kind of go together. But because fasting is missing, 
You say, well, we, you know, you got your last program. I don't know how you did. I'm sure, I'm sure it was good. You say, well, we had all this. We prayed and we had all this. How much more could you have had if there was fasting and prayer? Well, I prayed about this and God did this. I prayed and God gave me this amount of money and boy, we needed it. How much more could you have gotten if there was fasting? We don't know. Because it's been missing. But if those disciples had been fasting and if they had cast out that devil, everybody would have been wondering at the mighty power of God because of what had happened through them. Instead, Jesus had to come down and care for the situation. We have tried to set East Valley Baptist Church up to function solely on the power of God. And I don't say that spiritually. I I say that because in transparency tonight, the many times that we have failed and the many times that things have not happened, I knew what the problem was. The preacher or the people or the people or the preacher or both didn't get a hold of God. And that's a brutal thing to come to terms with. It's a convicting thing. But it just might shock you into reality. It might just shock you into doing something crazy like fasting. Why? Because you want to see the mighty power of God. And what we did last time didn't give it. And so obviously, we need to do something different. We need to do a little more We need to sacrifice. We need to be willing to face some affliction. We sure revealed our weakness. Boy, we need the mighty power of God. Hey, maybe what we're going through is this kind. Well, we know how to deal with it. We just got to be willing. Preacher. Father, help us tonight with what's been said. Lord, I pray that I've been a blessing. Folks, don't ever get tired of coming to church and being made uncomfortable. Don't ever get tired of that. Because there's gazillions of places where you can go in this country and never be made uncomfortable. They'll give you the latest lessons from the Batman movie. And I'm serious as a heart attack. It's just, it's ridiculous. Now, he's not interested in winning the most popular preacher in the Baptist circles. But he hit a nerve. That was good stuff tonight. My wife fasts religiously, weekly. Now, she'll tell you that a lot of times, not a lot, but some of the times it's just for health purposes, which it is good for your health. But most times it's connected to a spiritual need. And we've seen God, and we've done it together at times. I'm not as religious about it as she is, obviously. Look at that, you know. But we've seen God do things. In fact, talking about preaching, I preached on that subject at Denny Corll's National Conference in Lexington. Not, I don't know how many, it was, a, it was quite a while ago, when we were in a fast for a particular situation with one of the children, and God answered. I preached on that subject. And it went over about like it did here tonight, you know, just And for those of you that've been around here, you know, I kick myself sometimes because you know you preach, you know, you, you, the things that make you successful are the things that keep you successful, and I'm not smart enough to make sure that we stay on top of that. We have had seasons here where as a church we fasted together. And we saw God do things. And those of you that were here over the years remember that. We had teenagers not eating lunch at school because they were fasting with the church. And we got we haven't done that, Brother Justin. I'm going to just tell you, we haven't done that for a while. Now, I don't know what you're going to do with that. I'm not going to go home and say, well, we have cooked at church on Wednesday night and God preaches about not eating. <laughs> 
Or you can look at yourself and go, boy, I need, I need God to do something. And I've been banging my head against the wall praying. But you're in one of those this kind of situations. Thank you, Brother Justin, for having the guts to make a Wednesday night crowd uncomfortable with the truth. When that doesn't happen here, we'll be just like every other silly church that's out there. Where all they're doing is just pacifying. I'm thankful that you made me uncomfortable because I need it. Good stuff. Let's stand together. Father, bless the invitation to our hearts. May we search the truth. May the truth search us tonight. As they close.